Coinbase custodies Bitcoin for eight out of the 11 Bitcoin ETFs. Depending on who you follow online, they're either sounding the alarm or they're praising Coinbase. But the question is, how secure is the Bitcoin being custodied on Coinbase? Welcome back, everyone. This is a very interesting, sticky topic. Why? Because there are so many different angles, right? There's the people who just simply can't stand Brian Armstrong and think he is an enemy of Bitcoin. There are people who praise and believe in Coinbase because, right, they started off as a private company, were able to grow their customer base and their earnings and eventually become a public company where eight out of the 11 U.S. ETFs are being custodied. So people, some people sit there, look at Coinbase and say, hey, these guys are doing a great job. Now, somewhere in between all of this marketing and all of these different narratives is the truth. And what we're going to try to do is figure out what is actually accurate. And the way that we're going to do this first is by going through the actual prospectus for the ETF, somewhere in between all of these varying narratives is the truth. I don't know if any of you guys have ever heard that saying, there's your side, my side, and the truth. Well, this is really no different uh, when it comes to corporate narratives, right? Even though a corporation isn't a person, there's still a narrative behind it. There's marketing behind it. Uh, just think of a corporation as a really well-funded person to a certain extent. Anyways, um, let's dive into what Coinbase's responsibilities actually are uh, in this whole uh, ETF custody scenario. But also, we're, we're going to take a look at how these how these shares are actually created, and again, what the responsibilities actually are, because. Really, this is what matters. So I myself have also stated that I don't believe that the, the Bitcoin ETFs um, have a reserve requirement. Now, indeed, it says in writing that they're going to buy the Bitcoin, um, but I never actually saw anything in the documentation. And the people who have pointed to the specific documentation, again, Nowhere does it specifically say that a certain amount of Bitcoin needs to be held in kind. Now, regardless of my narrative, we're going to take a look at what the actual prospectus says, okay? And it says here, no shares are issued unless the Bitcoin custodian or prime execution agent has allocated to the trust's account the corresponding amount of Bitcoin. Authorized participants will not directly or indirectly purchase, hold, deliver, or receive Bitcoin as part of the creation or redemption process or otherwise direct the trust or a third party with respect to purchasing, holding, delivering, or receiving Bitcoin as part of the creation or redemption process. And what they're talking about here are the actual shares that are created. I know this sounds insane, but I'm going to show it to you guys. Um, the the companies that are that that are paying to have these shares created they're paying this in cash they're not paying this in bitcoin so anyways let's continue now another aspect of this is the you could see in the prospectus that there's a little bit of a disagreement because as larry fink actually pointed out he would much rather have in-kind redemptions, okay, which means you could actually sell your ETF shares and you would be able to choose to receive Bitcoin instead of cash. Now, anyways, let's dive into this because again, it looks like it looks like there's a bit of a disagreement around it. So the sponsor believes that it is generally more efficient and therefore less costly for spot commodity exchange traded products to utilize in-kind orders rather than cash orders because there are fewer steps in the process and therefore there is less operational risk involved when an authorized participant can manage the buying and selling of the underlying asset itself. That's right, guys. What they're saying here in the prospectus is that by using cash and cash equivalent instruments, this adds 
a level of operational risk to the entire process. As such, a spot commodity exchange traded product that only employs cash creations and redemptions and does not permit in-kind creations and redemptions is a novel product that has not been tested. That's in the prospectus, guys. Think about that. Further information on the trust, okay? The trust is not a banking institution or otherwise a member of the FDIC or Securities Investor Protection Corporation, the SIPC, and therefore deposits held with or assets held by the trust are not subject to the protections enjoyed by depositors with FDIC or SIPC member institutions. Neither the trust nor the sponsor insure the trust's Bitcoin. Coinbase Global maintains a commercial crime insurance policy of up to $320 million, which is intended to cover the loss of client assets held by Coinbase Global and all of its subsidiaries, including the Bitcoin custodian and the prime execution agent. I'm pretty sure Coinbase holds a whole lot more than $320 million worth of Bitcoin for its for the ETF clients. So this is... I don't think this is a good thing. Anyways, anyways, let's continue on. In the event of insolvency or bankruptcy of the prime execution agent, okay, or the Bitcoin custodian in the case of the vault balance in the future, given the contractual protections and legal rights of customers with respect to digital assets held on their behalf by third parties are relatively untested in a bankruptcy of an entity such as the Bitcoin custodian or prime execution agent in the virtual currency industry. There is a risk that customers' assets, including the trust's assets, okay, this, <laughs> pay attention to this very carefully, may be considered the property of the bankruptcy estate of the prime execution agent or the Bitcoin custodian and customers, including the trust, may be at risk of being treated as general unsecured creditors of such entities and subject to the risk of total loss, markdowns on value of such assets. Now, it would be it would be an incredible shame if the custodian of eight of the 11 US ETFs all of a sudden had some type of a major issue like this right after of course the bitcoin uh the, the bitcoin uh fiat exchange would let's say go up another 5x maybe even 10x all of a sudden right the coinbase has an issue and lo and behold those assets right? Fall under that forfeiture. And if you think for a second that um, as an investor in these, in these products, you're going to be getting back the Bitcoin value of your assets, you're very mistaken. They're going to take a snapshot and you're going to get back the USD value of whatever date they choose. Okay. So Again, this I, I know that people are trying to make this sound like, oh no, you know, you got to trust Coinbase. Coinbase is doing great things. They're huge. They're public. They're audited. They can do no wrong. No, okay, that's not true. Worldcom was also publicly traded and audited. Tyco Security Products was also publicly traded and audited. Lehman Brothers was also publicly traded and audited. Enron also publicly traded and audited. So when I see when I see these kind of hopium tweets by guys like Alistair Milne, right, where he goes, the Coinbase ETF FUD is pretty low IQ stuff. Essentially, you're accusing enormous public audit and regulated companies of being as shady as FTX was. Yes, I just listed to you publicly traded companies worth billions of dollars, which in some cases have heavy, government ties that had no problems ripping off their shareholders, okay? So this business of, yeah, let's trust this company because they're huge, they can do no wrong. The, the, I mean, does the term too big to fail mean anything to you, right? Like, I mean, th this, is, this is nonsense, right? All this is, is essentially trying to create the illusion of security by essentially removing all of the risk and just thinking about all the rosy rainbow happy thoughts 
about a company. That's it. This, they can do no wrong. They're huge. Under the public eye, everything is great. According to the IBIT prospectus, I do want to point out that it does state the trust holds only Bitcoin and cash. So finally, Brian Armstrong, right, CEO of Coinbase, chimed in on, on all of this back and forth of, of what's going on, the, the disillusionment around uh, Coinbase's ability uh, to not get hacked and not lose ETF Bitcoin. Okay, so here we go. Not sure what this is all about, to be honest. All ETF mints and burns we process are ultimately settled on chain. Institutional clients have trade financing and OTC options before trades are settled on chain. This is the norm for all our institutional clients. All funds are settled in our prime vaults within about one business day. If you want audits, Deloitte audits us annually. We're a public company. I doubt our institutional clients want people dusting all their addresses, and it's not our place to share for them. This is what it looks like if you want a bunch of institutional money to flow into Bitcoin. As for CBBTC, yes, you're trusting a centralized custodian to store the underlying BTC. We've never claimed otherwise. Eric Balkunas actually retweeted what Brian Armstrong said, and what he said was this. People keep asking me if I believe him. He's referring to Brian Armstrong. Yes, I do. Mostly because BlackRock isn't playing around, folks. They would flip out if coin was screwing around with their Bitcoin. Plus, it would violate the 33 Act. And, and we all know, we all know that public companies, okay, they are the most trustworthy, transparent entities that we have, okay? The companies that I just listed off before, like Lehman Brothers, Enron, WorldCom, uh, exceptions, exceptions to the rule, okay? Guys, look, it's, it's not about any of those things, okay? It's not about any of that. People are going to do whatever it is that they're compelled to do, okay? Um, just because a company was run properly for many, many years, it doesn't mean that a new CEO can't come in who is possibly, possibly has a moral line that's blurred and has no issue screwing over shareholders and their customers in order to attempt to increase their wealth. Okay. So the, the whole point is, is that although these are nice fluffy words, it's just a corporation in the end. These corporations are made up of people. People have their incentives. Continuing on, the reason this theory is a thing is twofold. Bitcoiners looking for scapegoat to blame for selling pressure instead of looking in the mirror. It must be the ETFs, but all they've done is saved your bags from sliding into oblivion multiple times. Number two, people who invest in BTC are generally skeptical of the government and institutions, which I get. The same thing happened with gold bugs and GLD, which they called paper gold, said the vault was empty. It wasn't true. This is like deja vu all over again. Okay, so what Eric said there, right? And again, I, I want to believe him too. You know, obviously I, I want to believe him. Um, the idea that, oh, you know, Coinbase won't do anything because, uh, you know, because BlackRock is so huge and they need to be taken seriously. Um, with all due respect, that didn't stop the mortgage crisis. Okay, that didn't stop the dot-com bubble, right? Keep in mind, in the dot-com boom, a whole bunch of companies got a whole lot of cheap money to create vaporware and vapor websites that nobody needed, okay? The same argument could have been made back then. The other piece is this. Eight of the 11 ETFs are custodied, US ETFs are custodied with Coinbase. Now, whether or not you accept or agree with this, is irrelevant because the truth is that company and its custody services are a honeypot. Plain and simple. That's what that is. Now, granted, okay, granted, Coinbase claims to have multiple levels of very stringent security, but as I just read to you guys, their liabilities, it's not going to cover everything that they could lose. Not even close, considering right now, if I'm not mistaken, between the 11 ETFs, if you look according to Time Chain Index, I believe they have almost a million Bitcoin. Now, of course, not all of them are custodying, custodying their Bitcoin with Coinbase, but eight out of 11 of them are. And out of those eight, one of them, one of them 
is BlackRock, which is the biggest. So, yeah, I, um, you know, the other piece to it is this, right? We won't know how bad it is until something absolutely terrible happens to Coinbase. That That is the truth. Now, do I want something like that to happen to Coinbase? Obviously not. You know, like that, that wouldn't be a good thing. Um, but unfortunately, when I put the tinfoil hat on, I can see the scenario where, hey, listen, in order to save the economy, right, in order to stop a major recession, we need to, you know, we need to take ownership of these assets. And if you think I'm lying or you think that that can't happen, then you need to go back to the mortgage crisis and you need to pay attention to what actually happened, okay? The winners and the losers were picked. That's all that happened, okay? And the winners, they got to essentially, they got the privilege of buying up the assets of the losers for pennies on the dollar. So if we think for a second that Coinbase is somehow too big, too powerful for that to happen, I think we're mistaken. Okay, one last tinfoil hat take and then we're done. Um, the other tinfoil hat take was this, okay? There's no there's no secret um, that there is a Silicon Valley elite, which consists of multiple Silicon Valley players, such as people like Peter Thiel and his VC firms. Um, and then there is Wall Street and legacy finance, legacy banking. Um, they both want to be at the top, right? They both want to be in charge. But really, it's only one of them that can be in charge. Now, it's an interesting scenario where one of the biggest legacy finance players, BlackRock, right, has their ETF, um, has their Bitcoin ETF, and, and custodies their Bitcoin with Coinbase. And like I said, so do another seven ETFs, right, for a total of eight out of 11 that custody with Coinbase. Now, that may seem like Coinbase is in a position of power, but we also have to remember um, who, you know, who wags the dog, right? Who wags the dog's tail? And in my eyes, it's not the government telling Wall Street what to do. It's Wall Street and the bankers telling the government what to do. So I believe, I believe that the financial, uh, financial legacy system has still has significantly more power and more sway than the West Coast technocracy. Um, and I do believe that currently we are watching a kind of a, a coup, uh, play out. We'll see. We'll see if that's true. We'll see if it's not, um, but the last piece that I wanted to say to this is that this, all of this scenario doesn't play out unless we get the massive bubble, the massive asset bubble that is going to come from all of this financial behavior. So guys, it's going to be very interesting times ahead. I'm here for it. That's all I wanted to talk about today. I will catch you tomorrow. Tomorrow.